Welcome to the Kicks EAP podcast, your monthly podcast with important leaders in education from Eastern Europe, Middle East and North Africa, Central Asia, and the Asia Pacific. I'm your host, Ryan Allen, assistant professor at Chapman University here in Southern California, and my own background is in international and comparative education. Let's start the show. Today, we welcome Camilla Kobiezina, an independent researcher based in Kazakhstan, who provides data analytics to NGOs, ministries, and presidential administrations. In the show, we run through her research background, what it's like working with the government, the importance of media outreach, and more. Let's jump to the interview. Thank you for joining me today. Now, I, I looked at your background, you're an independent researcher, and you you've done all these kind of interesting things and and, diff, and worked with different agencies I, I think people would love to hear maybe your story or a little bit about your educational experience to to lead you to that position it looks like you have a background in international relations and sociology and and, and a lot of focus on on education now so can you maybe just talk a little bit about your education and then to the position yeah, sure uh, well, uh, when I was studying in university, I graduated from uh, regional studies. So it's a kind of international relations um, faculty. And um, I actually didn't have anything uh, close to sociology. But um, when uh, our um, future empl- employer asked uh, our professors to advise someone, to recommend someone for, for the job, our professor, uh, she recommended me and my uh, friend and future colleague. And we so we started in 2010, we started uh, doing sociology. First, of, first it was like uh, we were doing descriptions. It was not, uh, it was simple enough. And then uh, we started to do some more sophisticated things. Like we designed methodology and questionnaires and guides for focus groups and in-depth interviews. And uh, what I found most interesting in sociology and why I stayed in this sphere, because uh, it was the first time when I understood that uh, people can have really different opinions on the same uh, events. And, um, well, I was so surprised when people uh, told us, like, uh, we are so satisfied with our life. We are so glad. We are so happy. And then they told us that, like, they are waiting for a... Uh, water pipe to come to their uh, um, rural uh, community. Uh, so, I mean, they didn't have any water, but uh, they still were happy. And it was so surprising for me that so uh, that is why I uh, really liked this fear. And uh, that is why I'm still, I, I still think that, uh, first of all, I'm a sociology researcher and I'm really interested in um, studying our society and people's moods and opinions and um, motivations. And, and through the years, I, I worked for many near government agencies. They were not governed in itself, but they worked for government, like for presidential administration or, or sometimes for uh, parliament. So... Uh, we prepared a lot of analytical stuff for them, like uh, to um, provide uh, changes in policies uh, with analytics, with uh, information, with data. But um, I really like in the past uh, two years, I, I'm working independently and I really like it because I can choose the topics uh, to research uh, myself and I can choose something that is more um um important and significant for me myself so that is why i started um studying such questions as uh, gender inequality inequality in uh, income uh, poverty um the situation uh, the, this material status of uh, migrants and uh, people in rural um, communities so i think that this this is something that I want to add up because, you know, I, I myself um, grew up in countryside and like many Kazakhs, they grew in, up in countryside because, you know, uh, we were not so much urbanized. Uh, but um, I want to bring this experience to people who uh, make decisions because, you know, sometimes it seems like they forget uh, uh, where they came from and <laughs> you need to like r- remind them and uh, to tell them that uh, these people they still have some problems wow. 
Yeah, I think I, I think oftentimes when we're researchers, we, we think back to our own life yes. to connect either things that we, we want to fix that, that maybe we didn't have or things that we saw and, we're, and we want to understand that more. So uh, it, it sounds like that's part of your experience as well. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it, let, let's maybe jump into your your research a little bit. You 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 have a, a lot of different areas as we as we already talked about a little bit, but you know I know some of the things that you're looking at are sort of issues with uh, rural women in Kazakhstan. Can you maybe talk about some of the barriers and some of the things that you policies that you've sort of suggested potentially? Uh, yes, uh, I joined the project. Uh, it, it was actually a project of uh, sort of foundation in Kazakhstan. Uh, and um, Applied Economics Research Center. Uh, so, so I joined the project like as, uh, as a sociologist, uh, and our um, task was to to define a port- social portrait of rural women, like to to define what are they, how who are they, what is their um, financial status, uh, what is their employment status status and do they have any opportunities to uh, study to to be employed uh, to um, sp- spend uh, some do, do they have spare time for themselves and that kind of questions and uh, one of the questions was do they ever participate in uh, state programs for employment like for rural women as well what i learned was um uh, why we decided to um, look into this uh, into this group in rural women in, because we learned that uh, rural people they are usually fin- financially uh, deprived comparing to uh, urban people and um, secondly women are usually poorer than men so we understood that uh, and it was presupposed that um, rural women they are poorer than uh, rural men and they're poorer than urban women and they're poorer than any, anyone else in the country and um, our our this main um, question was how do they have any opportunities to uh, get out of this do they have any possibilities and we understood that they don't because you know uh, comparing to urban um, women, they are usually more um, more uh, engaged in household chores, and they usually have more children at their at ha- their home. And usually, um, they live at homes together, not only with their children but other extended family. And uh, they have to like um, pay attention to everyone and to uh, make sure that every everyone is okay and that everyone has something to eat so they spend all almost all of their time preparing food and um, making some uh, like uh, doing something outside well uh, what we learned that for example usually when we talk about men's uh, typical men's work or typical uh, women's work uh, we mean uh, something in the rural area because you know uh, usually men have their men's work outside uh, the house. They are working with animals, so they feed in them. And but in we and uh, we learned uh, from our study that nowadays in Kazakhstan there are too few people who actually can have uh, livestock, like uh, who, who can afford them. So uh, even in rural area, men don't have like rural men's work. Like, they they usually work like urban men and sometimes they even work in in the cities and they go to the cities to get money because in in rural areas there's no work to, at all so uh we um see that uh, there are too many possibilities for rural women because they don't have time uh, and there is almost no work for them and they don't have a possibility to like migrate from um, countryside to city mm, through through the week uh, through the weeks mm, like men do. So we try to we try to uh, prepare recommendations so that um, this group would be one of uh, target groups because you know now uh, we have such target groups as young women, young young men, just unemployed people and. Uh, there is no such group as uh, rural women, but <clears throat> they actually what what they um, also are deprived from uh, is 
the opportunity to study and to participate in state programs because, well, usually you have to pass through trainings, you, you have to uh, visit them and um, spend time, spend a lot of time, like seven days. And they don't have that time because they have small children and they have extended family and they have their course, uh, household course. And so uh, we understood that uh, actually they need help and even more help than anyone else. Uh, I hope that uh, our study was was read at, <laughs> by people who make decisions. But at the same time, what, uh, what surprised me again is that um, these rural women, they uh, thought that they are much more happy than urban women because they told, we have this fresh air, we have the, these uh, vegetables, and um, we are more happy. Like, we're happier than these urban women who have to work all the time <laughs> wow. and don't see their children. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about maybe the, the surprising results that we get in our research or maybe things that, that were unexpected that sometimes potentially the most memorable and, and you try to sort of make, make sense of, of what that means. And it sounds like you're still uh, kind of grappling with, with that idea. Uh, I found it interesting. I, I saw uh, you, you had a, a blog post on about the research, which I was able to, to read. We will post that in the show notes as well. But uh, something interesting that I noticed was that the older women, the older uh, cohorts of women uh, had more uh, vocational education and vocational background, whereas that the women of the younger age groups didn't really have vocational education. But um, uh, they had higher education, so more like a university. So I, I, I found that interesting to, and then thinking of sort of the history and, and, and de-Sovietization and these types of things uh, is kind of fascinating. Can you maybe talk a little, a little bit about, uh, maybe not in this exact study, but just the context of, of education and, and maybe some of those, uh, some of those changes and that, that you're maybe um, seeing with different mm -hmm. generations? Well, uh, you know, um, it's, it changed a lot, you know, from the um, 90s, our, I think that our government understood that um, education is the most important thing that can be invested in education of all people, of most people. Like, And um, that is why usually uh, everyone is trying to get higher education. I mean, it, it is not okay to have just vocational and it's not okay to have uh, high school education you need to have higher education at least everyone tries to and uh, we have a big uh, amount of grants from government like for scholarships for go from government uh, to so that many uh, students they don't pay for it for their higher education and what is interesting what is more interesting is that in Kazakhstan girls are usually more educated than boys for example among girls as far as i remember uh, around 60 percent have higher education among men it's around 40 i think the ratio is, is around that and and uh why is that is because usually to get a grant like like you usually girls are made to study well at schools and they have to be like more diligent and to be uh, to 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 be more hard working as uh, as long, uh, um, but um, boys are not encouraged to do that. Like boys, like oh, they are boys; they can do anything. Like they they will have for like physical work, or they don't have brain, don't have to have brains. Like <laughs> and uh, so it ha it happens often uh, that girls studying very well at school they. Uh, proceed to study at uh, um, universities and they get grants that is why they are paid by government so they don't have to pay themselves and at the same time we see that like you noticed that even in rural area women are st started to be more educated so sometimes they after they got their higher education they don't have any other prospects for themselves like more than just to get married and to live where their um, husbands live. So they, they return to their rural area and they live with their family and 
live a, a life of um, without any like ambitions, big ambitions. But uh, we, when we conducted the research in Central Asian countries, not only in Kazakhstan, this the new facets of uh, educational uh, this uh, educational inequality, uh, we noticed that uh, in Kazakhstan we ha we have more girls who proceed with higher education than in other countries, like than in Kaz in Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan, of course, or uh, Uzbekistan, and we. And we thought that maybe we need to be ha uh, thankful to our government that they have, they give the, these grants and they they give this opportunity to girls to study more, to have more schooling years, so that they would choose their way and not just um, uh, get married after school, for example. Yes. Oh wow, I, I would like to maybe talk a little a, li a little bit about. Uh, the government and your work with the government. You've worked with the Ministry of Education, researcher role, consultancy role. Can you can yes. you maybe talk about uh, what what's it like and and are they receptive and and are there what are the barriers to to working with the government and, and do you ever get any pushback in your research and they well, say no uh, we can't. Uh, I've had around ten or... years of uh, research experience and about. Eight of them, I worked with uh, NIA government uh, agencies. And I as I told earlier, I provided analytics for presidential administration and for parliament and for ministries. But, you know, the problem was that <laughs> these, all, all this research and all these analytics, uh, they were closed. And we could not share uh, the results with anyone else except the clients. Like, and the client was government. So I think that the main barrier is when something is not public, you cannot like discuss it and you cannot press on the government <laughs> like, uh, because they can have this analytics, for example, and they can look at it. Maybe they can take it into account, but maybe they cannot take it into account. And you will never know. First of all, you will never know. And secondly, you will never be able to like make them do something because no one knows about the results of this research. No, we provide we we've conducted a lot of research, and <laughs> most of them people they don't even didn't even hear. And sometimes people you know people they don't even know that there are so many researchers in Kazakhstan. And sometimes they're asking, for example, I'm um, in Facebook, and sometimes people even ask their do we have any researchers? Where where are our sociology researchers? Does anyone does the government does even know anything about Kazakhstan? Like, and we, we think I think that yes, they know, but I don't know. Do they use it or no? So I would say that now, as a public expert, as a person who is present in media and who can share the results of researchers, because they are not governmental anymore. I think that now I have more tools to influence something. At least government has to answer, at least uh, has to uh, listen and um, respond to, um, for example, to our articles or to our uh, discussions, public discussions that we have. Uh, usually we, for example, when I work with Paper Lab Research Center, uh, they um, don't. Uh, they don't usually only make studies, but also they uh, conduct uh, public discussions, and uh, they um, invite uh, ministries and um, deputies or, or representatives of parliament. They try to discuss uh, the pressing questions with them, so that it, it would not just be a discussion, but it would be a discussion to think and to. Um, make a decision um, that will change something like policies. Right. Is it, it, I noticed on your website, you, you do a lot of media or you have some media appearances. Is, is this one of the reasons why you're, you're trying to do maybe some of these medias is so you can, you know, you can be a part of the discussion, be a part of the, the discourse. In yes, actually um, it happened. So surprisingly for me, I, I participated in a, Paper Lab Research Center, they uh, have a, a program uh, which is called uh, Making New Experts, and they conduct it together with uh, U.S. Embassy. Now I, now I think that they're going to have a continuation of it. 
so I participated in this program, and one of, of the goals of this program was to um, strengthen media presence of experts. So that, you know, in Kazakhstan, there are a lot of pseudo experts, like not real ones, and they are like writing posts on everything, and uh, people listen to them and uh, and think that they uh, they tell tell truth and uh, so so this program is made for uh, experts who have knowledge and who can share it so I participated in it and um, I've learned that it is so much important uh, not to just conduct the research but to share with the, its results and uh, to discuss them uh, and to uh, try to connect with government because you know even though even when you are critical to government's um, decisions usually this is the only way to change something you need to cooperate and that is why um, yes that is why this is one this is my tool actually <laughs> when I, I became a media present a expert a public expert you know I was was invited to many events, uh, to the ministries, uh, Ministry of Indication, analytical centers. They have uh, around three or four of them, and I, I connected to all of them, and I spoke to all of them on, on many phases of education. And uh, like at least they tell me <laughs> that they are interested in cooperation and they are ready to share their data so that we could analyze them and uh prepare some, some materials for them so that they would use it in their policies for example i conducted a research it was a small research on uh how teachers are trained in the context of modernization of uh secondary education in kazakhstan it was it was helpful at, at least uh they decided to um make assessment of their trainings because usually you know, there is only one like center who provides these trainings and no one actually assesses them and no one knows, do, are they effective at all? <laughs> so it, it was not so uh, sophisticated like recommendation. Uh, it was not so you know, smart, I think, but they thought they need to, to use it. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. I mean, all of it's great to, to be able to position yourself as, you know, a leading expert in the country to get on the, these media uh, outlets to be able to spread that message. I think that's that's fantastic. We're, we're kind of coming to the end of, of the interview. It's it's definitely been a nice chatting with you. I, I just have one question, one final question. Maybe if you have any advice uh, for international organizations uh, who, who are looking to sort of raise uh, local experts' voices and to, and to sort of, you know, make it easier to, to hear from people like yourself from international I, I think that, first of all, uh, what we met, the problem that we met, for example, when we conducted the um, regional um, research in Central Asia, is that it's hard to find local experts, but you need to find local experts because, you know, you need to work with local experts. This is my advice, I think, because in you know they they have this understanding of the context better than you than anyone in international organization, any smart person in the world, because you know we live here and uh, we see what is happening, we feel it, and uh, secondly, we know the language people speak here. Uh, and I mean not only the national language, I mean the language, like the, the terms we use. Like That is why I think this is the main uh, idea that uh, international organizations should use. Like They should closely cooperate with local experts and, um, and maybe they need to uh, finance more programs so, like, if they want local experts to raise their voices. Like, they, they need to finance such programs like making new experts it is being financed already but i mean i i i'm sure that there could be more during uh, for example during pandemic uh u.s embassy in kazakhstan they fin financed the the 
analogical program uh, that is that was called like that, that was for um for for me for medical for medical uh, workers like like they needed to raise their voices over the voices of people who don't know anything about covid and who you know we had a, a big problem during pandemic because uh, there were uh, many anti vaccination activists mm. and uh, they and uh, that is why we needed to raise like medical workers uh, voices so that they could be heard more than these anti-vaccination right. activists. So I think that uh, such programs are really great, and they they should be they should be there should be more of them. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's actually fascinating even to hear you talk about the issue of anti-vaxxers because from my uh, seat here in the United States. You know, we hear about our own issues with anti-vaxxers quite a bit. And, and, and some people talk about it as it's maybe just an American problem. Uh, and, and we can see and what okay. you're telling us, yeah, problem, you know, something around the world that people are kind of, of thinking and, and looking at. And uh, that's, that's really uh, fascinating. To, well, Camille, thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing these, these stories and, and your experience has been has Thank been you fascinating. for inviting me. <laughs> And this concludes our Kix EAP podcast, which is released every first Wednesday of the month. Of course, the opinions expressed on the Kix EAP podcast are solely those of the host and the guest. The Kix EAP podcast is made possible by Kix, which stands for Knowledge and Innovation Exchange. Kix is an initiative of the Global Partnership for Education. Globally, Kix is administered by the International Development Research Center in Canada. NORAG in Geneva hosts one of the four regional hubs of Kix. Find us on the NORAG or GPE Kicks websites. You can subscribe to the Kicks EAP podcast, newsletter, and webinar series, and also learn about Kicks global or regional projects. Additionally, you can subscribe directly on Spotify or SoundCloud to receive notifications of the new monthly podcast episodes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>